The Old Testament comes from 1 Samuel 17. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubics and a span. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come up and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this of ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. David, asking the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that you should defy the armies of the living God? What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not going to be able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield barrier in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over, and he saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel." All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle of the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And I'm going to turn the page over and finish the reading. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, taking out the stone, he slung it, struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. And I want to thank Diane for leaving the best part for me. <laughs> Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even wind and sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the, the sidelines are not exactly where you're supposed to be in the middle of a battle. And yet, that's exactly where the army of Israel, along with uh, King Saul, their leader, found themselves in this, this battle, this war that they were in with the Philistines and their champion, Goliath. We got his uh, height in cubits and spans in our reading today, but uh, just in plain uh, English feet about nine feet tall, something like that. So maybe not the kind of a giant that you think of in fairy tales, but nevertheless, a very, very large fellow. Paralyzing fear in the face of that kind of threat, face of someone, something bigger than you, something stronger than you, is actually not that unusual. And so I want to take you back to another instant in history, not quite as far back as uh, Old Testament times. Uh, uh, this is uh, D-Day plus one. So, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we, we observed the 77th anniversary of the original D-Day, June the 6th. So D- D-Day plus one, June the 7th, 1944. And General Dutch Cota, Assistant Division Commander of the 29th Infantry, comes on a group of uh, Allied American soldiers, and they're pinned down by a a position that the Germans held inside of a farmhouse. And so the general makes his way up to the captain that's in charge of this uh, little unit of men. He asks them, you know, what are you doing here? Why haven't you taken that building over there? And and the captain replied, "Uh, sir, the Germans are shooting at us. And Coda replied, well, I'll tell you what, you you start shooting at them. And then what I want you to do, I want you to watch me. Because I'm going to take a squad of men and I'm going to show you how you take a building that's held by the enemy. And that's exactly what he did. Took took a squad of men with him, got up as close to the building as he could, used a hedgerow for cover. And then uh, when they got as close as they could, then then they broke cover, ran at the building. This squad coming after him, they're all yelling like banshees, threw grenades into the windows as they went by that part of the building, got to the front door, general and another guy kick in the front door and throw in some more grenades, they go off and then uh, run inside the building. Meanwhile, the Germans running out the back. And so he comes back to this captain and his men, he says, all right, see how to do it? You know what to do now? Yes, sir. Now, relating this event in one of his books, the author John Eldridge asks the question, why were these guys pinned down? They almost seemed like they were surprised that they were being shot at. It's like they forgot that they're in the middle of a war. And in a war zone, you're going to get shot at. Have we forgotten that too sometimes? And maybe on this this Father's Day weekend, you know, we we who are dads, we can ask that question too of ourselves. Have we forgotten that we and our children are actually living in a war zone? Literally. Our entire human lives lived out in a war zone. And the enemy is the devil and he's fierce and he literally seeks to destroy not just us in this life, but to destroy us for eternity. Saul and his army were not pinned down by bullets. They were pinned down by a barrage of bluster coming from the blasphemous mouth of Goliath. Fearful, 
all too aware of their weakness, their smallness in the face of this threat, negligent of their duty, they were waiting for someone else to come along and stand up and fight in their place. And haven't we all been there ourselves? You know, we, we don't always take very seriously the call that we have been given as God's people to get into the spiritual fight ourselves. And, and, and you know, for those of us who are parents, to, to, to lead our children, if you will, into battle as well. We can be like King Saul, just kind of standing on the sidelines waiting for someone else to do the job. And that's actually how Satan wants to keep it, with men and women and children and all of us standing on the sidelines, uninvolved in this battle, disobedient to God and his orders, right? He's the, he is the commander after all, ignorant, negligent of his words of truth and teaching. Now, we didn't read this part, you know, look at this chapter. We couldn't read the whole chapter just for the sake of time, so it kind of cut and trimmed. But if you go back and you look at chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, you find out that for 40 days, Goliath came out issuing his threats. Now, it doesn't just say 40 days. What it actually says is 40 days in the morning and in the evening. So 80 times all total, he comes out. It just keeps wearing them down, just increasing their their sense of fear and certainly their sense of shame and cowardice as well. And you know what? That's exactly how Satan works on us too. He's persistent with his temptations. He never gets up. He just keeps coming over and over. And of course, when we fall, and we often do, then comes the next temptation. And the next temptation is to believe that because you've fallen, you've fallen too far. And, and that because of your, your shame and guilt, because they're, they're, they're so great, you know, you just kind of stand on the sh- sidelines shuffling your feet and you're looking down at the dirt instead of looking up where you're supposed to be looking. And that is to the grace and the mercy of God that actually forgives you for your sin and your failure and your fall. And resting in his promise that because he forgives, he lifts you up and, and puts you on your feet again. So, and, and that's how the devil works. He, he, he tempts mothers and fathers and, and others to be careless in, in raising themselves up in the faith and raising children, you know, tempts us to think that we can be, be raising people but not placing them on a firm foundation of God's truth in Christ. And at the same time, he tempts children of every age. And hey, we're all children of somebody. He tempts us all to stray from whatever faith and obedience to God we may have been taught. And then he overwhelms us with regrets over what we could have done, what we should have done, and and just, you know, now what am I going to do with the mess that I've made of things? So we all know, we all know what it's like to have stood on the sidelines in our own weakness and failure. You know, what a shock it must have been. After 40 days of Goliath, you know, getting out there and boasting and bragging and blaspheming and threatening, finally to see someone actually step out of the Israelite lines and say, I'm going to take you on. What a shock. No, no. Goliath's confidence in himself, in his own size, in his own strength, Goliath's confidence in his, his strength, that wasn't shaken. But what was shocking to him was that actually someone would come out and face him, and especially this someone. Some guy, you know, dressed, you know, armed like a shepherd, got a sling, he's evidently got a stick in his hand. It was insulting to Goliath. That's what he says. What, you you treat me like a dog? You're coming out here and you're going to face me with a stick? Yeah, watch the stick, watch the birdie. It's the stone I'm going to hit you with right between the running lights. That's what's going to take you down. And that's what did. And, And what an agonizing moment, don't you think, for the Philistines when they saw it all take place. It, my, my sense of, of what it, it must have been something like is when Goliath went down, th- there must have been kind of a stunned moment of silence on both sides, don't you think? That the, that the Philistines, they're looking, did, did he just go down? And, and meanwhile, over on the Israelite side, did that kid just take him down? And, and then all of a sudden, 
you know, sort of erupting in this, in this, on the one side, sort of a groan, and oh my goodness, and they're on the run. And then on the other side, the Israelites, they're, they're, uh, their intake of breath and that moment of silence erupting in this great shout of victory as they, they flood the field, and they're, they're after their fleeing enemy. But can you imagine that moment, that pause, as it must have seemed like just the whole world stood still? You know, that could almost describe the stunned silence of the forces of evil on Easter Sunday morning when Christ rose from death. Can you imagine right from the, from the, the, the sense of, of victory that, that Satan, one would expect, felt in he, knowing that the Savior had been put to death? It appeared that his mission had failed, and, and yet in the midst of that defeat, all of a sudden... God snatches victory. Jesus rises to life again, proving that He won the victory over death, over the devil, over your sin and over mine. You see, what God actually did through David, He has done on an even greater scale, a cosmic scale, in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, what we see in David is actually a foreshadowing, a picture of God knew he was going to do all along. That just like David went out alone to face the enemy in the place of cowardly Saul and cowardly Israel, Jesus goes out alone to face the enemy in the place of his disciples who had all run, in the place of you and my place as well, in the place of the whole world. Wherever we have failed to face temptation as we should, and we have, wherever we have been negligent in spiritual things, and we've done that too, where we've been defeated by guilt, where we have been immobilized by our own fears, by our own worries of what the world is, is about, of what the future might hold, for everything that has kept us fighting sin and fighting Satan, Jesus went out in our place and defeated our enemy. Only this time, what struck the fatal blow was not a simple stone, a simple cross in an empty tomb, a crucifixion and a resurrection, which is not so simple when it comes right down to it, but pretty simple for God, right? the author of life, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life for us. Now, when you think about it in these terms, the issue for us then today is not whether we have been always full of courageous faith like David was, or whether we've been fearful like we see Israel was on the sidelines. We already know the answer to that. In, in fact, if you continue to look at the life of David, as we have mentioned uh, pretty recently, you can find there were other times that he was on the sidelines himself, if not on the lines of the enemy. But for all of us, dads and moms and kids and teens, the, the reality is we know that we've been too much like Israel. We've been pinned down on the sidelines instead of on the front lines, carrying the fight of faith to the enemy. And yet the promise that God gives us in Christ is that just like undeserving Israel has a hero step out and rescue them, so we have one who has stepped out in our place, though we don't deserve it. And as our champion, he has won the victory for us. And this God, now, who saves us by such forgiving, merciful, loving grace, is the same God who also trains us that we may have a stronger faith in the midst of the battle. Remember in the account that I shared with you at the very beginning about uh, those, uh, those actual soldiers uh, during World War II, General uh, Dutch Coda, you know, they're... they're pinned down. They need someone to come along, show them how to do it. Well, in a similar way, isn't that sometimes the case with us? I mean, we really are weak, and we really do need to be trained, and, and we often need to be retrained, reminded again, here's, here's what you do. You know, the Israelites evidently had never faced a giant before. Paralyzed by their fear, they had forgotten if, if they ever even knew how to actually fight that kind of enemy. But through David, God reveals to them, here's how you do it. You know, and the answer is, you know, here's how you do it. You get a bunch of shepherds together. You just keep putting them out on the front lines. That's not the point. The point is this, right? That, that David went out in the name of the Lord. He went out with confidence that God was actually the one fighting the battle for him. That's what it means in the presence and in the power of God himself. 
And in a similar, well, the same way, really. That's what it means for us to rest by faith in who God is for us in Christ Jesus. Jesus not only defeats Satan for us, he absolutely does. But what he's also doing for us is he is strengthening us and he is strengthening our families and he's teaching us with his word, here's how to fight the devil. Because the battle goes on. Now, even as I say that, we want to constantly remember that it is only Jesus who saves us. And, and our striving to follow him, even having been brought to faith, never saves our souls, especially when we remember and as we confess how often our, our, uh, our, our following him has failed to live up to his example. But that doesn't mean he's not training us. I mean, listen to what David says himself. Psalm 144, verse 1. He says to God, praise be to the Lord my rock. He trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. And another psalm, Psalm 118, for those of you who are uh, archers out there, he says this, he trains me so that I can bend a bow of bronze. <laughs> what are you saying? You know, this is like a bow that, you know, how could you pull it back? But God strengthens me. God trains me so that I can actually do what would otherwise be impossible for me. And, and how does he do it? How does God train us? Well, first of all, by assuring us that he actually is present. That's what David believed. God is with me. He's right here on the battlefield. In fact, the battlefield already belongs to him. He's already won the victory in the most important sense. And that's what he says to us. And, and so the more we look to him, trusting that reality, what we're actually being trained to do is to keep on looking to him for help. And, and then he trains us in the midst of this to do what? To pray to him. You know, what, what's prayer? Well, you know, using that sort of battlefield mentality, imagine that you're pinned down somewhere. You know, you're being shot at with mortars and machine gun fire and all the rest. And if you were in that position, what might you do? Well, might you not get on the radio and call in for support? And isn't that what prayer is? You're simply calling in for fire support from the one who's actually directing the whole battlefield? And doesn't God promise that he will answer our prayers? And hasn't he done that for you? In so many circumstances, you can't even remember them all. And then he also trains us to do this, to continue to look to his word, to read his word, to believe his word as we battle our fears and our temptations and our sins. In fact, speaking of, of training us, remember what Jesus did when he was actually one-on-one -on -one with the devil in the wilderness. Remember that? And, and the devil tells him, you know, after 40 days of fasting and he's hungry, he says, just turn these stones into bread. And Jesus comes right back at him. Man didn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You see, that's the stone he slings at the devil. And that's the stone that he gives to us as well to, to fling right back at the one who attacks us. And this word, of course, includes all God's words of commands, guidance, instruction, correction, encouragement for us. But above all, it is this word that he himself is with us, the word of salvation that tells us and anyone who will believe it, everything that Christ has done to save us and make us his own. This Father's Day weekend and every day of our lives and every minute of the day that's the word that you and I need. It is the word that our families need. It is the world, or excuse me, the word that the world needs, that our community needs. It's simply the word of God's mercy and power and grace that takes hold of us, that moves us to faith, that moves us from the sidelines and right into the field of victory, which after all, already belongs to our Savior. In whose name we say amen. I invite you to rise. May this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. We continue by confessing our faith together using now the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That in this favorable time, the day of salvation ushered in by Christ's incarnation, the grace of God would be received by all, and that God would support his ministers and remove all obstacles from believing the word they preach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the endurance of the gospel with its blessings amid every hardship, struggle, and suffering, and for the steady conviction that since we have Christ, we possess everything. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For fathers and families that our Father in heaven would open wide our hearts to one another for love that is genuine, speech that is truthful and patient that is constant, that he would enable us to commend ourselves in everything as those known by God's love and, therefore, unashamed to serve one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all noble sciences that plumb the limits of the earth, and the order of creation which God has set for students, professors, researchers, that the Lord of all knowledge would give them joy in their discoveries and humility before his majesty, and that in everything the Holy Trinity may be acknowledged as our true God and judge. Let us pray to the Lord for our civil servants that they would gain respect for and recognition of God's creation in its nature, that we would use the authority given them from above in accordance with our Lord's good design for the world, not the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in need, especially remembering Deanne Weathers, Eileen Phillips, Rex Zabel, Renee Batt, Dale Small, Zoe Highland, Andrea Leonard, Jamie Klein, Deanne Weathers, Lyle Tickmeyer, Merle Lenners, Tiffany Snyder, Ben Owens, Anita Starbuck, Marilyn Walker, Brianna Hoffman, together with family member of Amanda and Caleb Lobby, who is struggling in, uh, in his health, that setting their fears aside, they would recognize our Lord's care for all who are perishing, for peace to calm our troubled consciences, and that God would not reject our prayers for their faithfulness, but teach us to trust fully in Him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the family of Dave Stowe's, that they may be comforted by our Lord's promise of eternal life for Dave and of the coming resurrection. These and whatever else you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good morning. One thing that I love about babies is how they can fall asleep anywhere, in a car seat or while being held in their parents' arms. I've even seen a toddler fall asleep on his father's shoulders while you know getting a ride. He just kind of laid his head down and, and fell asleep. One time when I was a toddler, I fell asleep at the table in my high chair, face down in a piece of birthday cake. But as we get older, uh, there's more to think about as we go to sleep. First off, you know, even at elementary age, first off, we have to get comfortable. Maybe we have trouble sleeping because uh, we can't find our, our special stuffy, Or maybe we, we need a special blanket. Uh, we might struggle to fall asleep because we're too excited. Maybe grandma and grandpa are coming in and we can't wait. Or maybe there's a family trip coming up. Sometimes, however, we can't fall asleep because we're scared or we don't feel safe. I remember just a few months ago that, that we had a tornado warning late at night. So while everyone was already in bed and uh, as parents we rushed around waking everyone up and, and making sure everybody got downstairs to where they were safe and uh, then when everyone was safe we were able to fall back asleep. But when things were happening, when we were in danger, nobody was asleep. We hear of a, a great storm like that in our gospel today, and, and we hear of sleep too. The disciples and Jesus were on a boat late at night, and a great storm came over them. There was wind, and there were waves, and there was probably lightning and thunder, and the disciples were worried that they might drown. And do you know where Jesus was? He was asleep on a pillow in the back of the boat. Well, the disciples, they woke him up. 
probably warning him that it wasn't a safe time to be asleep. There was work to do. There was hoisting and, and rowing, maybe scooping out the water, anything to keep the boat from sinking. This wasn't a time to sleep. This was a dangerous time. This was a time for action, a time to do something. So Jesus woke up. Uh, I like to think that when he woke up, he got up slowly, giving a nice prolonged stretch. And, and after he woke up, what did he do? Well, did he scream in fear as he felt the, the waves and the, the, the rain? Did, did, he, did he scream and go, ah? No. Jesus knew something that the disciples had forgotten, something that we often forget as well. That no matter how crazy or scary the world is, that God is always in control. He's in control of our health. He's in control of, of natural disasters like fires. He's even in control of the wind and the waves. Jesus demonstrated that as he, he stood up and he, he told the wind and the waves to be still. God is still in control of everything. He's so in control of everything that he's holding our reservation to life forever. So no matter what happens here on earth, no matter what happens in our life, no matter when we may pass away and die, we are safe with him forever. So when we lie down at night, we can rest peacefully like a baby, not because we have everything under control, but because even better, God does. Will you pray with me? Say, dear God, Give us peace, knowing that you have saved us through Jesus Christ, your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.